Hello, everyone, and welcome to the BFI Film Academy's July Lab. Uh, my name is Alex, and I'm the Film Academy Festival and Events Manager. In today's session, we'll teach you everything you need to know about funding for your short films. So this panel discussion will be hosted by Lauren Dunn, who is a 2017 Screen Daily Star of Tomorrow, British Screen Forum Future Leader, BFI Vision Award winning, and uh, BFA long-listed breakthrough producer, and also lecturer in filmmaking at Manchester Metropolitan University. Um, Lauren will introduce you to all your panelists today, but just before I hand over to her, I'll let you know a little bit about how the session will run today. So my colleague Fiona is managing the chat box. Um, so if you have any more generic questions, questions for us about the BFI, about the Film Academy, um, about um, the lab series or any of our other events, then please pop those questions in the um, chat box and Fiona will be answering them throughout the session. Or feel free to say hi, like um, I notice you're already doing and introducing yourselves. Uh, but if you do decide to use the chat box, please just a reminder to be respectful to our panelists today and also to be respectful with um, each other. So uh, please no offensive language and please don't share any personal information um, either. Um, for those of you who haven't seen it, our um, code of conduct for our digital events can be found on the Eventbrite page that you use to sign up for this event. So feel free to check it out. Um, and we've also um, set up a Facebook networking group um, if you'd like to network with each other um, and potentially find collaborators for your project. And um, Fiona will share the link to that um, Facebook group. Um, um, yeah, she's just done it. Um, so this is the link to our Facebook group in the chat box. Feel free to join it and um, introduce yourselves and your projects and um, coll start collaborating with each other. Um, however, if you have any questions for our panelists today or for Lauren, then please put those questions in the Q&A box on the bottom of the screens, like I see somebody has already done. So not in the chat box, but in the Q&A box. And my colleague Kate will be managing that box throughout the um, session and feeding um, the questions to Lauren and will devote the last 15 minutes of today's session uh, for your questions. But feel free to start popping them in there now if you um, know that you have a question that you won't answer it. Um, and also just to let you know that the session today is being recorded. Um, the recording will be uploaded to the BFI YouTube channel um, next week, but also the link to that recording will be emailed to all of you. So if you miss anything today or just want to watch the session again, you will be able to. Um, and now without further ado, I'm going to introduce Lauren. Enjoy the session, everyone. Hello, hi everyone. Um, thanks for having me, Alex. I'm really excited to host this panel today. Um, as Alex says, I'm, I'm a producer, I'm a film producer. I've made lots of short films, ranging from budgets of like hundred pounds to like a hundred thousand pounds. Um, and I've also worked as an exec for uh, people like the BBC and uh, Film 4 and the BFI, selecting and commissioning short films as well. And funding is kind of one of my favorite topics and something I'm asked often by filmmakers about how to get funding. I think it can be one of the hardest things as a filmmaker is knowing where to find funding for your film and also how much to ask for and then how to actually secure it when you found a fund that you want to apply for. So I'm hoping that I can kind of demystify that process for you a bit today and discuss a few different options that are open to you. So I'm, I'm here with an amazing panel if you wouldn't mind revealing yourself, guys. And I will introduce you very quickly to everyone. Um, and I think Alex already explained that you know, if you've got questions, uh, stick them in the in the chat for us, and I will I'll answer those. Maybe some of them as we go, and I'll make sure I allow enough time at the end for for everybody to get their questions answered. Um, so I'm here with um, Gwenvir, who is uh, Gwenvir, sorry, uh, who is a development exec from Film Cymru, who's um, Film Cymru is a, oh, sorry, my, something just popped up on my screen, uh, is set up to support Welsh born and based filmmakers. And they support filmmakers from shorts right up to feature films. Uh, and they have short schemes that are in partnership with BBC and BFI. And Gwenfire, I might just ask you to talk a little bit about BFI network in general as well. So those filmmakers who aren't based in Wales just have kind of an understanding of how the how BFI network works and how you can access their money if you're if you're not based in Wales um, and we're here with Justin Owen who is the business manager Owens sorry I'm getting everybody's name wrong it's terrible Justin <laughs> Owens um, who is the business manager from Sure Scripts which is a screenwriting platform 
uh, and it's an international fund uh, for writers covering short films, features, podcasts and TV pilots. And Justine also worked on the launch of Slated, which is an online film financing platform. And these are both new uh, platforms to me. So I'm really looking forward to finding out more from you, Justine. Uh, and we've also got Emmanuel Lee here. And Emmanuel's a filmmaker, an exceptionally talented young filmmaker who has made numerous award-winning shorts and music videos, um, including which I believe is your most recent short, was it Emmanuel, that picked up the uh, Best New Talent Award at BFI Future Film Festival. So Emmanuel's gonna be giving us a real good insight from a filmmaker's perspective about um, budgets and how to make your film and, and applying for funding. And we've also got uh, Heather Swift, who is the Senior Director of International Kickstarter, which is probably the biggest and best known crowdfunding platform for creative projects. Um, and if you don't know how a crowdfunding platform works, you basically put your project up and people who really believe in your project can back you to help you get your project made. So it's a way for you to kind of really take power and ownership over your, of your own project, basically. Um, so I want to get stuck in straight away, if that's OK. Uh, and I want to find out some more about how your funds and funding platforms work and how we as filmmakers can access them. Um, so Gwenvai, would you mind telling us some more about Film Cymru and, and uh, like I said, possibly a little bit about BFI Network and, and what's on offer for new talent? Yeah, so um, I'm a development exec and I work across the larger development slate, um, which is funded by Welsh Government, but then also across the BFI Network Wales slate, which is the sort of, um, like to think about it as the gateway for emerging or new filmmakers to access our funds. Uh, so that is funded by BFI Network, as Lauren said. It's not just a Wales-based thing, it is a kind of a department of BFI that works towards supporting and discovering and yeah, just helping emerging filmmakers. So if you're not based in Wales, there are um, nation funds, so Wales, Northern Ireland, Scotland, and then there are regional hubs. So whether you're based in the Southwest, the North, check out the website and find out where, where your local hub is and uh, get in contact with them because they'll be able to tell you about um, how their schemes and their kind of systems work better than I can, but they're all a really friendly bunch. So I do recommend looking that up. Um, so in Film Cymru, we have two principal schemes for shorts. One is called Folio, uh, which is the Welsh equivalent of what in England is called New Creatives, which is in partnership with BBC. And uh, from our perspective, that's for filmmakers who haven't yet got any kind of credit um, on, on filmmaking. So we get a lot of kind of spoken word artists, theatre makers, hoping to get their first experience supported by us and BBC Wales in a very hands-on way to make their first short. And those shorts are normally no longer than five minutes. So it's very much a kind of first attempt to experiment with making your film um, and getting out there and then our slightly more established short scheme is called beacons and so we'd expect people to have a little bit more experience maybe a credit on a short or to produce a theatre play or something similar uh, we're currently processing those and we've had about 90 applications I think so lots of lots of reading to do um, but the way that that works is that um, we shortlist down to about 20 often there's a period of development when you'll work with one of the execs be it me or my colleague and we'll work with you on your script or more particularly on your budget so we've had some quite ambitious shorts come into us before and we ordinarily make awards of 15 to 20 thousand which is which is all right for a short film you know it's not lauren's 100 thousand but it's it, you can make a decent calling card with that amount of money if you're if you're sensible about it uh, and what we'll do then is look at the budget and look at where you can kind of amplify parts of it or if you've got ideas of partnership finance that you want to go into, be it private investors or uh, charities, anybody that, that, that you've been speaking to who's interested in, in backing you, we'll talk about how to kind of soak that up into the budget as well. Um, I think that's pretty much it. Also to note that so Beacons works across documentary, animation and live action. And so obviously when you're financing, there are different considerations taken there with animation taking a long time and being painstaking and there being different financial implications. Similarly with documentary, it's a slightly different process. Um, so again, if you have any questions about any of that and the differentiation between financing and budgeting for those different forms, do, do ask or get in touch. 
um, if you want to speak to me in particular on the Film Cymru website, all of our email addresses for all of the execs are, lift, are listed and I'm more than happy to, to chat about any of that. Um, that was that was a bit of a whistle stop, but yeah, that's great. I've got I've got more questions for you. Don't worry, that's not that's not the end. Um, but I just wanted to sort of um, echo what um, Gwenvi is saying there, in that the guys at BFI Network are super approachable. You can drop them an email or a tweet. They're always up for having a chat and telling you more about how the funds work and about your if you want to talk about your project and like specifically that you know that's what they're there to do. We're very lucky. In this country to have a, a public fund like this that we can access and it's set up specifically for you guys to support you guys um and sort of something that's very different justine i wanted to come to to kind of your platform um and just understand some more about how that works this is a very different offering to kind of our you know public funding um how does it work at sure scripts well thanks lauren first of all and thanks to everyone who's come on the call today um, Shaw Scripts is an independent company. Um, we're now based in the US. We were previously based or originated from the UK. Um, and we hold basically two seasons of our short film fund a year. So it operates very much in a, in a way that a contest would. Um, and it's also focused for screenwriters and filmmakers who haven't yet got a portfolio piece. So what Gwynvai was saying about having that first thing, you know, getting that first thing in your portfolio to prove your storytelling ability and your filmmaking ability. That's very much what our focus at Shore Scripts is. Um, so to apply is basically around 30 pounds. Um, we, we do do all our pricing and awards in dollars. So Sometimes that will vary depending on exchange rates, but basically it's about £30 to put your script forward. All initial um, evaluation is done on the script itself. So we're not looking for lookbooks or treatments or any of those kind of articles, if you know what I mean, the other periphery articles. It's really focusing on the script and the storytelling and whether or not that's ready to take that leap and go into pre production. So, as I say, there's a spring season and there's a fall season. And each time we make an award to a grand prize winner of what's now about £12,000 and a second prize winner who gets about £7,000. Um, and then we have a top 15 whose scripts we still champion and we send those out to our industry roster, which is about 230 people across the industry. That's production companies, managers, agents, distributors. Um, so there's lots in it really over, you know, there's those who get the production fund, get our support, get their projects made. And then there's also quite a lot of, I suppose, embracing that talent and trying to lift it and get it into get it in its first chance to be seen in the industry and appreciated. Um, I hope that... I mean, it sounds great. I think it sounds like, a, <laughs> like a, it really does. It's sounds very, a really great platform. It's and very I, rewarding to work in, Lauren. To be honest, I can imagine. It's, yeah, it's really lovely um, to have this community and see people grow as well over the years. Because mm. we started the fund in two thousand and sixteen, and just last year, our inaugural winner, Claire Fowler, who I don't know if Gwynvera knows the name of, but she won the BAFTA Quimri, sorry, the Welsh BAFTA for short film, <laughs> with the film that we funded, so with Salam. Yeah, amazing. But to actually see someone take that whole trajectory um, and see more and more of them coming through every year, it's just awesome. I think what is what is great as well is it really highlights the importance of script. I think very often as filmmakers, we get kind of caught up in the direction and what it's going to look like and the visuals, but everything has to come back down to like the, the quality <laughs> of your script. And I've got some more questions around that as well, but I just wanted to just ask um, Gwen Vyer and Justine before I move on. Uh, I think something that's really useful to know uh, when you're applying for funds like these, who are you in competition with? Uh, like how many applications are there and how many actually get selected how many get funded okay i'll jump in um so in our case we probably now that we're holding the two seasons per year there's probably over three thousand applications every year 
from, from that's from around the world. So, as I say, out of that, there's 15 finalists per season, and there's two production awards. So competition is stiff. Um, there's no way you can get around that. Um, <clears throat> but better to put two films into production that wouldn't have otherwise done it than than to not have that opportunity at all. And we do take our pricing decisions. So the entry prices that we charge, um, it's we're not a charity, but we do operate as near as damn it on a non-profit basis. So everything we try and do is to make it as equitable as possible. We don't have any trust funds behind us or investors or people like that. Basically the money coming in that, that everybody pays in to enter is what then makes the prize pots and helps everybody out at the end of the day. Um, and obviously pays for the script readers who they need a living wage. So it is very much that kind of consumption production turnover in the company. Um, and that's like I say, we, we've, so far we've found that people respond to it. They get a lot from us. They get a lot of help from us. Um, we just so try to oh, sorry. So, sorry. Um, so yeah, we average about 100 applications for beacons a year. And uh, we, so I think maybe if I go by the last round as an example, we shortlisted 10 down to development and we gave them an award of a thousand pounds each. And me and my, my colleague Jude kind of split them and would work with them on their script and on, on uh, budget. And I think it's really important to highlight what Lauren just said about and Justine said about the importance of script, um, because as a process, that is always the first thing I look at when we get an application before looking at the kind of visual materials or the CVs, because ultimately, say you don't have as much experience as the next person, what is gonna stand out is the, the kind of creative quality of the project. Um, and in terms, of, it'd be quite interesting to find out Justine, because as we're not a commissioner at Film Cymru, so we don't, particularly look to have you know um, a slate that looks a certain way so we're not looking for particularly issue drawn issue based projects or we're not looking for one comedy or one horror um, so there's not competition in, in, in that kind of sense you don't need to worry like oh if I put in a horror and there's loads of horrors does that mean it'll be more difficult we're just going to pick the best ideas um, but I don't know if, if that differs with you Justine and whether you're, you do look for particular kind of uh, genres or ideas or territories year on year or um not really um so what, the way we like to describe it is we want stories that move us that's the probably the best way to to describe it it's really the the power has to be in the writing um uh, the only secondary consideration is is it ready you know is that yeah. story ready we don't have a budget to spend another six months in development um, so we really need to have things that are, you know, literally at that point of, of crossing over. Yeah. Um, so that's very important to us. We get quite a lot of young writers or emerging writers coming to us and saying, is it important that my formatting is good? You know, and I said, well, yes, actually it is. <laughs> you know, it, it's not as important if, you, if your story is, you know, not, not really flying. That's probably something you need to think about more, but at the same time is we need to be able to deliver these scripts into the hands of makers. Um, yeah. So we don't want to be putting out something where, where there's going to have to be lots of work before that. Yeah, uh, just, quick, just quickly story, yeah. on, on that note, I was just going to say, um, maybe there's a slightly mis slight mistruth in what I said in that we, we do fund everything and anything, but I think particularly as this conversation is about financing, um, I think we do kind of look at the story and whether it's realistically going to be told in 15 minutes for 15 to 20. So if you've written a kind of like Holmes and Watson with all the kind of carriages and the costumes, that, that is something that we will look at and think, well, we can't really help you with this budget. And perhaps it does show a slight lack of awareness of what you can do with that money. So that's the one caveat I'd kind of put, put on that. That's like really great point and definitely something I want to come back to something I'd like to talk to Emmanuel about as well um but thank you for like clarifying how the numbers work because I think sometimes it can be really tough as a filmmaker if you get a no it feels like oh well the idea is terrible and I should just give up and that isn't the case you know um it's just that sometimes competition is really tough and it's why I wanted to come to Kickstarter next and Heather because I love Kickstarter and I had a project uh, I've 
done a you know a couple of Kickstarter projects, but we had one recently that we're shooting at the moment. It's a stop motion animation, um, and we really struggled with funding, and we put it on Kickstarter, and it absolutely blew up. And it was so great after having you know getting so many rejections from formal funds to be able to kind of take the power into our own hands. And uh, Heather, something I was really astounded about with, with that project in particular, it really kind of tapped into the animation community, just the, 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 the level of community and the fact that you do actually really build a massive audience for your film at the same time. And yep. uh, I just wanted to tell us some more about how Kickstarter works. Yeah, well, to jump off from that, I mean, it definitely, you know, beyond being a funding platform, it is a place to develop your audience and to make those deep and meaningful connections with backers that are going to not only help you fund this film, but perhaps the next film or, you know, whatever you do into the future. So, you know, of course, it's a great place for fundraising. Um, but I think that almost, almost kind of beyond the fundraising, that connection you get with the community is probably one of the, the best assets. Um, but yeah, I mean, maybe just to step back and, and talk about Kickstarter, Lauren, you did a great job of kind of explaining the mechanism. Uh, we are a rewards based crowdfunding platform. We're probably one of the best, best known and largest in the world. Uh, we have a laser focus on helping creative projects fund. So, you know, people who have heard of crowdfunding, you know, we don't do like charity crowdfunding or equity fundraising or anything like that. We're here exclusively as a platform to help creative things fund. Um, we've been around for about 12 years and we've been here in the UK for almost um, 10 years. I'm, I myself am based in the UK um, and it's our second largest community outside of the US. Um, there are 15 different creative categories on Kickstarter, but film has always had a really strong presence. Um, it, it has the, the highest number of, of launched and successful projects um, in any of the categories. Uh, more than 28,000 projects have funded, um, uh, you know, in the film category on the, on the platform, finding just amazing critical and commercial success. Um, there has been, I think, around 430 million in funding directly from backers to filmmakers and countless awards, you know, from those films. We've had uh, three Oscar wins from 16 nominations earned by Kickstarter funded films. Um, and really just like all sorts of things have been funded. So like more recent feature films like Last, Last, Last Black Man in San Francisco or Knock Down the House, some of you may have seen, have joined um, like veteran filmmakers like Hal Hartley and Spike Lee, you know, have all used crowdfunding and Kickstarter to fund um, all or part of their productions. And, um, and I'll say that most people think about raising funds uh, uh, for, for, for like post-production on Kickstarter, which, are, which is a great option, but the platform can be used for all sorts of components of your budget. It can be like even things like your licensing or e &O insurance or your festival premiere, just like any, any aspect of it, we've really seen it all. Um, no, no, you, you go, you go. Oh, I was just going to say on, on film, on short films specifically, because I just want to, you know, because we are talking about shorts today. I just want to say, uh, yeah, just to call out again, short films have worked particularly well on Kickstarter as well. So it's worth, you know, when I said those three Oscar nominated films earlier, they've all, uh, Oscar winners have all been shorts. So we had Innocente uh, in 2013, Period End of Sentence in 2019, and Hair Love in 2020. So we think it's a category that works particularly well on Kickstarter. Um, it's, it's produced the highest number of successful um, projects. So something like, actually the stat is, um, is that 58% uh, of all, all projects that are launched in the shorts category on Kickstarter go on to be successfully funded. So uh, th that's a pretty, pretty high stat. Um, I was just gonna ask because I think, you know, Kickstarter can just seem like a bit of a, like, well, you know, just, um, a a pot of gold at the end of the rainbow it's that sort of thing of wow it's you, you put your project on everyone's going to love it and everyone's going to give you loads of money and then you're going to have the money to make your film where it's not actually as simple as that and i just wonder if you could tell us a little bit about what makes a good campaign and just how much work goes into managing that came campaign while it's running as well yeah sure um yeah definitely it's not the case that you can just put something up and it will go viral i think that that's like the you know that's the fantasy um but the reality is that it takes a, a really strong first of all, like framing and planning and then really strong outreach while the campaign is running. So uh, maybe just, you know, again, staying at a, at a high level for now, um, I think that some of the best campaigns, first of all, um, invite people into your practice and into your, your film. Like one of the best things about backing a film through crowdfunding is that you get that kind of detail, that kind of behind the scenes, you get the sketches, you get to feel kind of a part of it. So, um, so including a lot of that kind of detail, those personal details and compelling details in the campaign can be really important. 
Um, second of all, that it would create a sense of, of urgency. So really that you can talk clearly about your motivations for making the film and establish kind of like why the world needs your film is really important. So that framing. Um, but, but yeah, the outreach piece of it is really important. And, and I find that um, it can be also a really successful model for people who might have communities of interest about the, the sort of subject or, or what it is that you're, that, that you're making. So, you know, something in your film that people can connect to outside of your stylistic or formal choices. So, you know, it's, you know, if you're making a documentary about a particular cult figure or, you know, something like, you know, a film about climate change or something where you can kind of go out and tap into those kind of niche communities that might want to boy and, and push the, the film along. But, but yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it is really about like tapping into not only your network and being really organized about how you're going to, you know, what emails are you going to send? You know, how, how are you going to send like to this type to your friends versus your, you know, colleagues, um, uh, empowering all of your crew and your, you know, anyone who's involved in your film to also kind of get out there and tell the, tell the story and, and get people to back the film. Um, but then also, yeah, going beyond those networks and looking at the communities of interest around, uh, you know, what you're doing. So, so yeah, at a, at a high level, I think it's really about that, that outreach and framing. Awesome, thank you. Um, Emmanuel, I wanted to come to you now, if that's okay. Um, and with so many amazing short films that you've made, uh, and, I, and I, am I right in thinking those have been made without funding? Yes, so um, I'd say I've made about, about 10 shorts so far, and I'd say only two of them have had budgets. Um, so, it, you know, I'm, I'm very new to this, to the world of actually having a budget for a film. Um, and my experience, yeah, has been mainly really on no, no budget productions. Um, and I wondered if you could talk a little bit about what you think the key uh, thing is to, like, what, what makes a really good short film? What's the key to a successful short film, do you think? So it's obviously not I, just about money. No, no, absolutely not. No, I think, um, I think the most important thing is that you really believe in it. And it, it's, a, it's a story that you, that moves you. Um, it's, uh, you can't expect it to move anyone else if it doesn't move you. Uh, and I think, yeah, I think to be truthful to who you are, to express through your short uh, the way you see the world. And hopefully that, that connects with people and people um, will uh, understand it. Um, and I can see, this is one of my questions, I can see it popping up in the Q&A as well about length and some people wanting to make longer right. short films. Is, what, is there a, and this is a question to everyone, what's the best length for a short film? Oh, um, the killer question. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, in my opinion, I, I think I generally generally try not to go over twenty five minutes. I think mean, I've only ever, ever really made shorts that are either okay. six minutes long or twenty minutes long, uh, and maybe ten as well. But I, I think the six to twenty mark is um, is is something that I'm, I'm comfortable working in. I'm not I'm not sure what everyone else thinks. Mm -hmm. So we have it written in our Beacons contract that we um, want the films that we fund on 15 to 20 to be 10 to 15 minutes long, because we think, especially with emerging filmmakers, that's probably both a decent amount of time to tell your story and to show what you can do, but also most realistic for kind of like potentially first time filmmakers to, to work to. Yeah, yeah. I'd like to... Sorry, Right. No, I was just going to say that the short film fund, the requirement there is between two pages to 30 pages. So we're all really saying the same sort of thing. We, people can write longer pieces, but again, it comes back to the, you know, Sherlock Holmes scenario, as Gwynfire said, <laughs> that, you know, is it realistic? The budget that we can give you, the, the story that you want to tell, is that really going to happen um, on that money? So, yeah, I think we're all... 20 minutes is the sweet spot. Yeah. I think, yeah, short, short films as a form is, um, gives you a lot of, you can experiment with that. You know, it's not a feature film where you can have a really expansive story. You've got just a few minutes and you can really go crazy and uh, mess with people for that, for that short time. So I think take advantage of the fact that it is a short film. I think as well, like from a producing perspective, I think, you know, and I often talk to filmmakers I work with, it's about where you want that film to end up as well. Um, and if you want that film to go and do film festivals, you have to think like a programmer. You have to think if you're a film festival programmer and you're putting together a collection of short films, 
if you've got if you've made a 20 minute film that's a big chunk of time in a in a short film program and it kind of has to then be twice as good as a 10 minute film because it's taking the place of two 10 minute films but if it's that it's going to live online or you've all, you've got you're going to do a screening for a community audience or there are different things where you want it to be a proof of concept for a feature that you're going to take and it's going to have some other purpose then I think that's when you can maybe push it a little a little bit longer but I also just wanted to share with you I did a panel with um Philip Ilson from London Short Film Festival and there was a question around run times of shorts and he said nobody ever watches a short film and wishes it was longer and I think that's a really good thing to remember um that the best shorts just feel really concise um and not ones where you're kind of like clock watching and thinking oh god this has been going on a long time um, so that's really helpful. And I got really caught up in that answer and I forgot to look for what my next question is. Um, so, yeah, I think it would be good, good to know as well from Justine and um, Gwen Vire, like what, what, you're, what you're looking for in an application. So people have found your fund, they've decided this is something I want to apply for. It's highly competitive. What are you looking for in an application to make it really stand out to you to think, yeah, this is something that I'm, I'll consider funding? Okay, um, I suppose, um, as I say, we're looking primarily at the script. Okay, so as I say, that is that is the document that we we take as a submission. Um, the point that Emmanuel made about, you know, what, what can you do with that 10 minutes on screen, let's say, what, 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 in, how can you flip someone's experience or open a new world for them in that very short amount of time? Um, and again, not just a short film, but if it's a proof of concept for your feature, can I really feel that? Can I see what that project's going to be? Um, we also funded a TV pilot, series pilot, um, one year. So it, basically it's just a short piece, I suppose, a short project that either stands in itself and totally gives somebody that a very concrete place from which they can launch further sort of projects they want to do, whether as a writer or filmmaker, or whether or not it's, you know, sort of the actual it's just it's a way to facilitate their project in the future so it might be something that they make that they then take to kickstarter and use there to to convince other people to join the project um but it is it's it's really difficult i suppose to say there is one thing you know for us it's all about story it's it's am i in that world before i've even got through the first third of the page that i'm reading this yeah i, I agree i think it's kind of like it's so difficult to articulate because you don't know that it's what your life has been missing until you've read it type of thing. And then you're like, how has this film not been made? How, how have I not thought of this? This is incredible. It's got to be made. So yeah, first and foremost, it is the script. I suppose just to touch on what Justine um, mentioned. So originally uh, my fund, Film Cymru, when it was Film Agency Wales, it was established because there wasn't um, a, a thriving film scene in Wales and so it was established to sort of seed that and to help it grow and I think we're doing a really good job film and tv in Wales is is thriving really exciting um, so when we are looking at those short applications as Justine said we're looking for feature ambitions and for people who are going to one day release something theatrically um, because we also want to um, foster a kind of economically thriving industry and with all the will in the world you're not going to be paying your mortgage by making shorts <laughs> so we are looking for people who are looking to set up their production companies and make their features um, that can be a very very far off thing but that aspiration is is really important to us the kind of the big thinking um what else do we look for and then again this sounds a bit of a cliche but i always think it's really fascinating when you get a story that could only be told by that person because you feel that if you let that pass that that person's got the authenticity they've got the voice and so we along with our scripts we have an application form and there's a space for a directors and producers statement and so I always find those really interesting as well to look at the aspirations and the motivations and why this is you know why this is the thing that you've put in, in front of me today I, I find that I geek out on that <laughs> 
that's really really, helpful thank you i really need to respond to that because this is this is one of the perplexes because we don't ask for that personal history um you know it's it's we i suppose short scripts was actually the whole purpose of it was to help writers initially yeah writers right at the bottom of the food chain you know furthest away from the, the sort of awards processes and all the public things that people see um so that's why we focus on the script and why we don't take the additional documents or the pitch decks or anything like that um it really has to be the story for us that that grabs us um i suppose the point there and why that that's sometimes useful for us is that we ask that one of the above the line talent be welsh born or based and so it could be that the writer isn't isn't welsh and so we're also interested then in seeing what the welsh director producer's vision is so um but yeah ultimately if the story is no good that's <laughs> not much help <laughs> um thank you guys never, I'm gonna co- never oh. say no good that's that's not good <laughs> Um, I'm going to come back to Heather, if that's okay, because Arjun's asked a really good question in the Q&A, um, which is about videos on Kickstarter. Like, How do you use the, the video function in terms of trailers and teasers and how do you get the most out of that? And what, what sort of things should you put on there? Your campaign. Sure. Yeah. Um, so you know, Kickstarter is a video-based you know platform. We know that the campaigns that have a video are much much more likely to be funded than those that don't. Um, thankfully for filmmakers, you know, video film is your medium. So uh, hopefully you can uh, you can craft something. Um, we typically will say two to three minutes. Um, you should be looking to tell um, something about, of course, about the story and including clips or sketches or maybe location shots or whatever. Uh, but also including the director or the cast or, you know, again, going back to that kind of like motivation. So um, and and kind of, yeah, backers wanting to connect with that project because they want to be involved or kind of support your vision. Um, so that kind of personal connection um, is really important. Um, making sure that, you you know, people kind of like always starting with kind of a synopsis of what the project is, is really important, though, like. Um, yeah, a, a kind of like common foible that people fall into is like talking a lot about the backstory and the mission and kind of everything, but don't actually just say what the project is, you know, how you're going to make it, when you're going to make it, the plan, like making sure that that's really clear as well. Um, but yeah, um, as I say, two to three minutes long, um, make that personal connection, give compelling details about, about the project. Yeah, I always feel like the video... Uh function on Kickstarter is like your secret weapon as a filmmaker because you should be able to just make something really exciting and interesting there and it doesn't have to be full of production value it's about what how creative you can be as a, as a filmmaker to kind of put what you want across um I've got another really good question here and I've just closed the tab and uh, where's it gone here it is from Ingo which is um maybe a question best place for Gwenvire um if you have a project which comes across as ambitious or unachievable, but you do have some ideas of how you could do it within a budget, how do you communicate that to a funder? Um, a, in the budget, I think, because um, we have a budget template that is part of our application and um, you, you can go quite granular. There's columns for kind of in-kind support. There's extra bits that you can fill in. So if it does seem ambitious and in the script, you're like, how on earth are they going to make that? Do detail it in the budget. If you're not a kind of numbers budgety person, um, there's also then that space within the kind of producer's statement to kind of say, hold my hands up, it reads very expensive, but these are the things that we're going to put in place. Um, and just be prepared to, to be interrogated on that if you are quite if you are if you are going through to the next round be prepared that you are going to be interrogated quite, quite keenly. So yeah, if you are putting something quite ambitious forward, just, you know, know right down to the bottom line, how you're going to justify it, I think. Um, I wanted to touch very quickly there on the producer role, because I think it's a very misunderstood role. And so I just wanted to take the opportunity to, to say just a couple of words about it, because as a producer, you know, people are often confused about what the role is I think that as a producer you're, you're it's your job to find really exciting projects and then make them the best version of what they can be that means really work creatively with the with the writer or writer director to make the story really great but then you've also got to have the ability to turn that into something 
real and understand and know how you might go about doing that. And that might be like bringing other people on your team who are really great at finance uh, or logistics, but you've got to have the kind of know-how of how to do that. Um, and Gwenvi, do you have to have a producer if you're applying to BFI network funds or at Film Cymru? Have it, is that a, a part of the application? Um, oh, we get asked this so often and um, we've done a few producers for us because I think you're right, Lauren. I think the role of the producer is, is woefully misunderstood sometimes and it's so, it, it can yeah. be so, We can do a so whole helpful. other session. I know, I know. I won't get too, <laughs> I won't get too bogged down, but... Um, that is one thing that I do say to a lot of um, filmmakers that I've chats with who run something called surgeries, um, maybe every couple of months where we'll block out a day and we'll, we'll have one-to-ones with people. And um, it, it, if you do find a really good producer, it will just help you so much in terms of navigating all of the kind of weird intricacies of the industry. In short, no, you don't need a producer, um, but it's a sort of difficult thing because if you are applying with that very, um, ambitious short or things that might need to be explained they will help you put together that application because they've got that sort of shorthand and that way of writing that can really help you out but also we don't want to discourage um writers or directors who who don't have those industry contacts from coming into us so that's something that we can help marry you up with later on down the road if you apply without one um so it's it's great if you found your dream producer, but don't be discouraged if you haven't found anyone yet and don't rush into finding one just because you think you need one to be successful. Um, and Emmanuel, do you, who do you collaborate with when you're making films? Do you have a producer or um, I know that you have a, a sort of like a filmmaking partner that you work with a lot. How does that collaboration work? Yeah, uh, so I, I, I self-produce all of the shorts. Uh, and I've done this out of necessity, really. This is what I've known about to, um, where um, can, can you hear me? Is it in my I'm just worried about the uh, But yeah, I think, um, yeah, from the beginning, uh, having no budgets, you have to wear all the hats, really. Uh, so I learned so much about uh, produce just as from having, having no, no other choice than to do it. Um, and yes, I, I've got I've got a filmmaking partner, Ethan, um, who I work with. And again, we met in secondary school. Uh, so we knew just as little as each other. So we were just learning on the job. Uh, and, and yeah, I think, I think um, with no budget films, I think the most important thing is to use what you have uh, and be inspired by what you have. So locations that you have access to, um, pe- uh, close friends who are or actors, or, or you know, if you rummage through your mom's closet, you might find a really interesting piece of clothing that might spawn a whole idea for a for a short film. Um, and I think it's just starting from that writing stories that um, all the elements are already in place from a production standpoint. That that will just that frees you up so much from having to worry about budget, um, and yeah, that's, that's that's all I've been all I've known really. It's just it's, all the films I've done have been inspired by a location that I came across, and I was just wondering what sorts of characters can have in that space, or was written for a specific actor. It was a friend who I really wanted to work with, um, uh, but yeah, just being really resourceful and making sure it, you repay favors. Yeah, I mean, like, I'm totally like you, I came up proper grassroots and everything was made on no money and no connections, which is going out there and doing it. So I'm like, right on <laughs> with that. Um, there's another question here, which is really great, which I think Lauren, would be... Oh. Would it be possible just to jump in? Oh, um, sorry, yes. Something I think people should understand with sure. Um, part, what, once we have those award winners, if they're writers, they may not be as knowledgeable, let's say, of the production role. They, they literally have just written a script and often um so the work that we do with them to support them to put the project together i think people should be you know i'd like to make the guys on this call aware that that's what we do um we also have a a roster of over 80 directors who can receive the scripts and these guys can try and partner up with should they wish to um we don't take any money from what the projects we don't take anything back um, and another one of our big supporters who I should have mentioned earlier is Ari the, ca- the camera people um, they basically offer free camera equipment and set equipment for the productions as well as where they actually you know where they actually operate so 
even if you're just a, you know you're sorry not just a screenwriter but if you're a screenwriter with no experience and your story comes through and you get the grant there's then a whole wellspring hopefully of support that's going to take your project through take it through production take it into release and distribution and festivals you know keep like i say giving it some promotion thereafter i just wanted people yeah, to no, know that's... it's not just there you go there's some cash and buy <laughs> Yeah. No, no, amazing. it's a, it's a re that's a, yeah, really amazing support network. And just to clarify, so as well as that, you could apply with a, a team, you know, an already pre-existing yes. team that you want to make the project with. Yes, if you're a, if you're a writer, I think the the thing is that the writer has to be active within the team. Mm -hmm. So a team that simply purchased the script from somewhere else and they or they have an option, that's not really our bag. But if the screenwriter is actively part of the team. Yeah, and they hold, they still hold the IP basically for that story, then that's perfectly fine. We also give money or we, we take submissions for finishing funds. We've started doing that this year. It's still about the script. We're still going to read that script, first of all, and we're only going to look at what you've shot after that process. But we try, we got so many demands for finishing funds that we just said, okay, if, you know, if you're, if you're happy to come board on that same playing field with your spec script, then, you know, by all means, come to us. So fingers crossed, there'll be a few more of those in the year as well. Great. That Thank finishing you. fund is, is great because also we get so, so many filmmakers coming to us. And unfortunately, it's not something that we really fund, but it's great to know that there's that option with you guys. Um, Emmanuel, I wanted to ask you a question here. Somebody has asked, um, as you're starting out as a, as a new filmmaker, how do you know uh, how much to spend on equipment? How do you get quotes on equipment? Is that a DP's job? Is that your job? How do you navigate and negotiate that? Right, well, um, if, if you've got a friend who's a DP who's got camera equipment, uh, that's great. Um, I, think, I think equipment is definitely important. Don't spend too much time and energy and money on it um because i mean how, how i how i started out was just i borrowed my mom's camera uh and it was just a really tiny thing that overheated after 10 minutes of shooting uh but that that's how i sort of learned the ropes um and then my filmmaking partner ethan he he busked for six months to save up for uh for a camera for, a, for an old battered canon 5d um and again that and then that was our, our production camera for for a long long time um but yeah i think with equipment get the best that you can find and just learn to run, run with it uh before you consider upgrading i think um you know if, if, um don't let it be too much of a barrier stopping you from making a film i think the, the important thing is just to learn learn the language of you of, of film or of and just getting out there and have getting experience shooting stuff um but if you are looking for equipment, secondhand is the way to go. Uh, Facebook Marketplace, you get some incredible deals on Facebook Marketplace. Uh, and the bonus is that there's real people behind it. You, you, know, you might make a contact or a friend from purchasing something on Facebook Marketplace. Cool, that's great advice. Thank you, Emmanuel. And I would add to that, if you've, if you're, you've you know, maybe you've got some funding from one of these guys where you've, you funded your project on Kickstarter and you want to bring in some bigger equipment, um, but you don't have loads of money to spend on it, it is worth speaking to places like ARRI or Panavision. Um, there's low, you can just Google camera rental companies. And if you, if you tell them that you've got a project that you're making and it's happening, they can be really supportive in lending you stuff, older bits of kit or things they have sitting on the shelves or the best time to make a short film, I think, is sort of like January, February. The whole industry is dead in January. So it could be a really great time to get money off your kit or crew who are up for just coming down and helping for not a lot of money. Um, so, yeah, don't don't be afraid to ask. Um, and I've got another question here, a couple of questions, actually, around age. And this is maybe something that everybody can speak to. In that there's, there seems to be a lot of sort of uh, focus on 18 to 30 year olds and funding around that age bracket. What happens if you're below that age or, or above that age? What opportunities are available to you? How do you kind of navigate funding and financing opportunities? From our point of view, um, we don't fund anybody under 18 or anyone in full-time education. But other than that, like... <laughs> So that's one of my bugbears, the sort of like sometimes the kind of age cut off. You no, know, we um 
We also welcome applications from people who've maybe taken a career break so that they may have had experience maybe 20 years ago, but they've gone into a different industry and will come back. But um, yeah, there's, it's, a, it's a broad church, all are welcome. Yeah, same, obviously on Kickstarter, you know, part, part of the reason why we exist is to, to provide kind of opportunity for anybody to fund, fund their film. So, you know, if you find that you're coming up against a, um, you know, the guidance of particular grant funding, you know, and you're outside of those age brackets, then, then we're one tool in your toolbox that you can turn to as well. Okay, um, so it's sure, again, it's open to everybody. There's no age restriction. Um, the important thing I suppose for us is that we use that term emerging so the, the writer or writing team we do have a restriction that you can't earn over fifty thousand dollars from screenwriting um so that's that's a really cool clause that's yeah love that well that it's and it like say sometimes you know it's really it's very unfortunate if someone's on you won you know <laughs> but the whole point is to try and make sure that we're focusing that, those funds and those opportunities into people who are just making their start. Um, we haven't had a child write a script yet. We haven't really had anybody, um, you know, genuinely starting. Um, but we do do we do get quite a lot of applications from students on their MFAs. Um, so we do we we have participated in that as well so that's good for good for us and good for them <laughs> cool um lyra's asked a really great question here and i'm kind of interested to hear your thoughts on this which is how as young and first-time filmmakers do you do you support yourself making short films um, and how does the panel recommend that young filmmakers support themselves while also trying to get experience in the film industry? So it's that kind of, how do you establish a career in this industry when it's, as you pointed out, Gwen Vi, really hard to financially support yourself while making shorts? And how do you carve out a career and support yourself at the same time? Um, well, I'll jump, again, I'll jump in because I started as a script reader um, and that's one job that you can do at midnight or six in the morning um it's a freelance role in the main it can bring you a lot of connections to producers and agents um different people in the industry and i would encourage anybody who wants to work in this industry to spend a little bit of time being a script reader because of the education that it gives you about telling stories the exposure that it gives you with the, the stories that are out there um, and like I say we, all these all these projects start with a script in in the main um, so yeah I think that's trying to get into that role just as a stepping stone um, but it will you know it's an income and it's an income you can do from sitting at home when it's when it's good for you so that would be my first piece of advice I think I would kind of say it depends on what depends on what you need to kind of keep you sane as well but I agree with Justine and kind of so when I when I started I actually started in theatre um, and so I used to work in as a kind of theatre usher which again was kind of like evening hours um, I was kind of meeting some interesting writers and directors but it was also very much something that it wasn't taking up too much of my brain space I could go home and switch off and not worry about it I could then focus on my kind of um, creative project projects and so that was really helpful as well just seeing what was going on and and being part of that kind of creative world and being kind of feeling then um empowered enough to kind of ask certain directors out for coffee or to pick their brains that was that was really helpful um on the flip side I also worked uh in the director's office for um, an artistic director of a theatre which was much more full on, you know, that was kind of like being a PA to an artistic director for 12 hours a day. That was a lot, but that was also really valuable in, as Justine said, there were so many scripts coming across my desk and I could kind of see the making process. Um, I, I don't think that kind of job is necessarily um, tenable for a long time if you're trying to kind of still have the energy to, to um, get your projects off the ground, but it was a really valuable experience for a short period to get that, but then yeah, I moved into the, the ushering and the, and the bar work because 
um, it just worked better for me having my days free to kind of write and produce and then head to the theatre in the evening to work. Um, and also it's a great community. There were lots of other young, young people or emerging talent like me working and we could kind of chat about the difficulties and there was a nice little network and that was really, that saved my soul a few times. <laughs> I want to hear Emmanuel's answer to this, but I, but but my, I'll, I'll just jump in and say that yeah, I, I also like agree that having a day job that's flexible it can be a really rewarding way to to kind of support yourself while you're um, while you're making work. A lot of my artists or filmmaker friends are like technicians in galleries or yeah, like ushers or you know things that are really flexible, um, but that can let you uh, do your thing. Uh, the other thing I'll I'll make a plug for because I'm based in Liverpool is uh, living in a cheap city. Um, you know, if you can live somewhere cheap, like if you can pay 300 quid a month uh, in, in rent, like it's just incredible what that unlocks in the rest of your, your life. Um, you know, I know that being in a bigger city like London or New York or whatever it is, you're going to have access to, you know, a creative community that you might not in the smaller cities. But I, I hope that after this pandemic world that, that we're going to get better at that, at like allowing people in, in regional cities to, to kind of make access to those kind of connections. So, yeah, shout out for small cities. <laughs> well, I'd say if you're starting out, I mean, I might be biased, but I think if, if you're starting out, if you're just starting out, don't spend any money like yeah on, on your films like don't, don't don't put that financial burden on yourself and don't put too much pressure on it being a really professional really professional really formal i think because when i started i was in secondary school so um i didn't have a job what what money that i did spend on films was, was saving up pocket money or going busking um and yeah i think um I guess when you, sorry, well, I lost the question. What's the question again? It's kind of financial. How do you, yourself. yeah? How do you support yourself while you're making yeah. films? Um, I guess just, just yeah, just not not spending too much on the films. I think a lot of the opportunities that came my way um, financially were only were because I made um, no budget films. And I think it's important that you just make you are able to prove to others and but most importantly to yourself that you can make a film with zero money, so that. Um, and then I, so the first job on a set that I had as a runner only came about because a film that I made got into a festival and then I went to talk to um, the, the festival director uh, and asked if they had any projects on the line and, and then he brought me on uh, to a lovely weekend in Hastings, which uh, I, I did everyone's laundry, uh, that was, that was a lot of fun, but, um, but yeah, no, I think, I think being unafraid to ask, being unafraid to just ask, being, to go up to, uh, you know, people with a lot of uh, uh, power or authority and just, just asking if, if they could, um, if they needed any help on, on set. And, um, and yeah, I think it, it, it builds, it builds. The more, the more you make, the more opportunities will come your way. Yeah, if absolutely. You, if, you, if you know how to ask yourself as well. Yeah, absolutely. I think just to, to echo all of that, I think don't stop making stuff. Just keep don't don't feel like you can't make it if you don't have the money. You just go and just do it, um, as Emmanuel says, because if you can make something on no money when you do get the funding in, then what you'll be able to do will be way more resourceful and exciting and interesting because that's what makes great films rather than the money itself. Um, and as these guys are saying, just try and find a job that's flexible. That's that's the best asset. And that's what I did. I had a very sort of flexible um, job that I was allowed to kind of step in and out when I needed to. And I needed to go and make films. Um, and I wanted to talk a little bit about social media. Um, how important is it to have sort of like a website and a social media presence uh, from a funding perspective? Do you look at that? Is that part of your application process or do you Google people? And also from Kickstarter point of view, like how much are, are pledges engaging with um, the campaign uh, owners like social media or web, web presence? I mean, I can kick off then from that aspect. Um, uh, certainly, you know, having a, a, a public presence online is important um, if you are going to be launching a, a Kickstarter campaign because, you know, so much of that is about catalyzing an online community. Um, I do want to uh, send a word of caution that, like, um, actually an email list can be a lot more 
useful in actually driving pledges than a big social media following social media is kind of like easy sometimes like you can click follow or um you know like somebody's facebook page with that that's pretty like low bar to com to commitment so getting somebody's getting like a landing page with an email list or organizing your own contacts into an email list and then doing those one-on-one -on -one email outreach like that can often be a much bigger driver um of, of kind of pledges or funding than, than a social media following yeah no we I think there's there's a section on our application forms where you can put that social media. Um, I personally don't look at it um, just because the the kind of the application itself is quite unwieldy. We have the script, we have the CVs, we have the application forms, and then people often send previous examples of work. And so I feel with with all of that, <laughs> it's quite enough to be getting on with the kind of get to get to know get to know the filmmaker. I would say, however, for other partners, so if you're sending things out to a production company, looking for people to potentially produce, um, or just to have a chat with, the more, the more kind of, uh, I think a website is great if you've got the, the resources to make that, obviously. Um, but, you know, even some of the, the br most brilliant production companies don't have a huge internet presence. So um, I wouldn't get too hung up on it personally. So we don't take account of social media as part of the application. That's not anything for us. Um, but in terms of engaging with people in the industry and your profile within the industry, I think it's absolutely essential. Um, we're, we're visually creative people, right, you know, right, writing and visuals together. So social media is an absolute gift for you being able to express your when you said about what what kind of writer's story or this you know this particular writer at this particular time um so i think having that presence is it's nothing more frustrating than than not being able to see what someone's like if they've if they've come to you um you know i think we all kind of expect that these days there will be some kind of representation um and i just wanted to say our hands up for things like short of the week and vimeo and those sort of channels as well um again you know if people are saying i'm a maker then these are the sort of places where i would just automatically go to and expect to see at least something on those on those platforms um more so maybe than youtube ironically um because i think you know once you've sort of dived into the filmmaking world then there are some platforms that are perhaps more um, expected than others so yeah not for the competition but by all, you know, as a person, then definitely you need to build your presence. Yeah, I, I'd say in my experience at least, social media has been pretty crucial in, in the growth of uh, my production company and um, and their presence. I think um, we have having a an official production company Instagram page that you know so many young people are on uh, social media these days that it's it almost be foolish to have have a presence there. And so we, when we started out, we just posted you know, behind the scenes photos and, uh, and then once the films are done, we, uh, up, we you know, upload where it's going, which festivals it's going to, and just building up this feeling that it's, it's, it's a bit more legit, you know, because in secondary school, if, you, if, you, if you're saying, you know, I'm making films, people are like, oh, you're, you're making films, are you? Yeah, uh, you're making you know, films with your mates on the weekends, but it just gives, your productions a bit more legitimacy and also it's like it's like a it's like an interactive cv almost uh and i think it, we made about five or six shorts for completely no budget before we started um before we decided to crowdfund for a short because we needed uh a location that was that was there was no way to get it for free so it was only because we had made those shorts and and had that press, social media presence and people saw that we were serious about this, we were, um, we were getting results, that we were uh, able to ask and people were willing to uh, donate towards, to, um, towards the crowdfund. Um, um, yeah, I think, uh, I, I, in my opinion, at least social media is really important. And also, that's what I was gonna say, yeah, a lot of people actually came to us um, contacting the, to our social media asking to um, work with us. And that's how we began, began to build this network of people who we 
now regularly work with um and yeah if, if we didn't have a social media page then that would that wouldn't happen I think it's really reassuring to hear that it's not you're not going to be judged on it from a kind of like a funding point of view, but also that it could be a really fantastic professional kind of networking tool. And certainly for me, I'm based in Manchester. When I set up my production company, I, I kind of created a social media presence. And then I found whenever I was at film festivals or networking things in London, everybody knew who I was from, you know, Instagram and Twitter, even though I wasn't living in, you know, those big cities, I was able to sort of be part of that conversation and part of that world. Uh, so I think it can be really useful. Um, Heather, I just wanted to come back to Kickstarter quickly. And if you could tell us a little bit about the, the project we love selection and how that works, because I know that can be a real boost to your project. Like, how do you get selected? And also, I'm going to just ask you another question in the mix, which is a different question, but just so I don't forget to ask you, what happens if you don't hit your target? Yeah, sure. Um, well, to, to take it backwards, um, if you don't hit your target, then no money changes hands, no fee is charged, and you can go off and try and find another way to bring your, um, your film to life. So Kickstarter operates on an all or nothing uh, funding model. And the reason why we do that rather than, you know, just saying, okay, you can keep whatever you raise um, is because we know that it creates a sense of urgency for people to kind of get behind you and get you over that. It just like pushes people a little bit farther to get you over that, um, over that funding line. So, so yeah, if you, if you don't reach the goal, then uh, the, the backers are not charged and you can either relaunch or find another way of bringing the project to life. Um, so that's that question. Wait, now I've forgotten the first question. What was the first question? Um, if you could just talk a little bit about the, the project we love selection. Oh yes, and, yes, yes, of course. And of course what that yeah. means and how you get it and what it can yeah, do so, Yeah, so there are a few different ways that the Kickstarter kind of surfaces projects to our community and um, like through different kind of like editorial and features and things like that. Um, one of them is our Projects We Love badge, which, we, which will make you kind of surface higher in all of our search kind of algorithms and things like that. Um, and uh, it's actually uh, selected by an editorial team who are just like looking at every single project that launches and trying to find great projects with great stories. Um, you'll be pleased to know that the person, the people who curate that are film specialists. So they're, you know, our, our wonderful film team who, um, Elise McCabe, who used to be at Brit Talk and uh, Liz, Liz Mo, who um, is based out of Portland and has done, has been in the film world for many, many years. So they have a, yeah, just like an eye for, for what makes a great film and, and um, and yeah, so, you know, something about the concept that makes it stand out or um, something about the team assembled, is it topical, you know, is it beautiful, but then also like the details that you're revealing on the page. So are you, again, like sharing a really interesting motivation or is the page well composed? Are you sharing kind of clips and, and sketches or, or shots, as I was saying? Um, so that's a sort of... Um, frustrating answer in a sense because there's no formula for how you can achieve it but um but just you know make the best thing that you that you can and uh and hopefully our, our team will pick it up that's really helpful thank you um there's a good question here which i think is worth us um touching on somebody has asked how you tackle diversity and inclusion in your kind of selection process i think that's maybe a good one to just kind of unpack a little bit So here at Shaw, we've got over 60 readers on the team. They're based all around the world. Um, there's, let's say, representation from almost any, any community. Um, what we try to do is we don't deliberately funnel scripts at certain readers. We allow those readers to select their scripts. Um, but there is a cross review process and a Q&A process that makes sure that if you like, no one's unduly preferencing one area or another, one genre or another, one community crisis or another. Um, so it's difficult because you have to stay somewhat neutral. Um, and we don't have a process at the moment for, if you like, positive inclusion. Um, that's something that we've we're really trying to find a way to embrace in this year and the next. Um, so the, what I suppose our focus is making sure that we don't debar anybody. Um, there's no cognitive bias, if you like, in how we make our system. Um, so it's something that as a fund, we, we work on quite a lot, actually, and you can find us sort of EDI action plan on our website and we have um, 
we have certain targets that we try and meet, but again, there's not, when we won't funnel particular scripts just because they come from a certain community. It still needs to be of a quality. Um, but to kind of speak to what I was saying before as well about why, why you're telling this story and why now, I think we have to acknowledge that, um, you know, in the past there's been a particular overrepresentation in, in shorts and in films. And so if there is a kind of story about a community or a lived experience that we feel that we haven't seen, that is going to be really exciting for us to, to interrogate. Um, yeah. Oh, and also on our application forms, we have a section where um, applicants have to detail their EDI strategy, um, whether that's on screen or behind the camera or um, how they package their project. Uh, could you just explain what EDI is? Sorry, <laughs> equality, uh, diversity and inclusion. Um, so, for example, um, in one project that I recently exact, um, there were a lot of non-binary or trans filmmakers on the team. And so they detailed how they were going to uh, organise uh, behind the scenes and toilets and changing rooms so that everybody was was comfortable and that there was no barrier in their working practice or similarly if we're working with somebody with um, uh, limited mobility then how we can how we can help them and how it's not any kind of barrier we also do um, if if you are successful not in our beacons funding in addition to the core award that we make you can come in for additional access costs um, for example, recently we shot a short where uh, one of the main characters is a wheelchair user, and so we weren't expecting them to go into their budget to make the necessary adjustments. They could come in for additional funding to facilitate that. So it is something that we're really trying That's to great. actively interrogate and try and do our best and do better. That's brilliant. Thank you, guys. Um, Heather, I've got another doubler for you. Um, two questions have come in. Um, one is a really quick one. If you could just clarify, um, is filmmaker target? Uh, sorry, filmmaker is a Kickstarter targeted at filmmakers in a specific country. Mm -hmm. um, and then my next question, which is somebody what somebody's asked here, which is a really good one, is how do you how do you go about building your contact list for crowdfunder and sort of like telling people about your campaign? Yep. Um, so we're open uh, for for creators to launch projects in I think it's like 20, 21 countries. So you know most Western European countries, U.S., uh, um, Japan, you know these kind of things. Um, so you can check out the site to see if your country is in there. And then in terms of who is the audience on Kickstarter, um, you know I get this question a lot, and I think it's important to to kind of re-emphasize that the audience that funds your film is gonna be primarily the one that you do outreach to and that you bring to the project. So it kind of links to the second question uh, in a second, but um, it's important not to get too obsessed about like who's on Kickstarter that I can, you know, where are they based or whatever. Focus on your community and think about the Kickstarter community as a little like bonus on top that you might get some, a few pledges through, but, but really it's gonna be through your efforts. So the, the country um, you know, that your backers are based in are gonna be the countries that you're targeting essentially. Um, in terms of the, the outreach question, um, again, it's a complex one you know, and we could spend a lot of time on it. Um, but yeah, I think it really just, it's about building, uh, like getting organized about, first of all, your own network. And then again, the sort of network that you might be able to access beyond, you know, around your film. So, so organizing your list of contacts in terms of like, um, yeah, like, who do I know personally, who do our, you know, all of the crew, like, you know, try and get them to, to share their list of contacts with you, you know, what, you know, you know, even like your university that you went to, or, um, you know, if you're working with various companies, can they share or can you are there lists of contacts that you can get through that so really just like, literally sitting down, looking at your contact list, looking at all your followers and just organizing them so that you can kind of group them together and then think about how you're going to target them through different types of emails. Like one might be like a friendlier friends and family email. Another, you know, might be a, a slightly more formal pitch. Um, you know, it's just, it's just slightly different. So I would say that, you know, yeah, just getting super organized. And then in, in terms of building your list um, beyond your own networks, that's where you're going to want to um, look into kind of the content of your film and, um, you know, like try and untie the themes and ideas in your project and mapping them to communities that are most engaged with those different themes and ideas. So like if your project speaks to specific communities with niche interests. So earlier I said, you know, if you're making it about a topic you're passionate about, like climate change, or you're making a documentary about a particular 
you know, a particular f- f- uh, figure, like a, a musician or, or something like that, that you're, that, you're, um, that you're targeting or that your subject is, then trying to find the communities around those things, um, the communities of your crew, your actors, like, and then just really asking yourself, where do these folks like live? Where, what do they read? Like, who do they read? Where do they post? And just really trying to build up uh, all that stuff. But I, but I think all of that kind of network mapping, you just have to be super organized about it. Write a list, do the map, like just get really organized and put it all on a spreadsheet. <laughs> yeah, I'm bang on. It's a, it's a lot of work, but it's really worth it. And then the more kind of traction that your campaign builds, the more that this sort of becomes self-generating and people sort of discover and find out about your project. But you've got to just put in loads of effort at the beginning. Um, so I'm aware of time and we need to wrap up. I've got, um, I'm going to answer one more question and then I'm going to, um, do a kind of close up question for our, for our panel here. And I, I wanted to just address, there's lots of questions coming in about production companies and questions directed to me as well about how, how to work with Delaval and me and like how to find producers and work with production companies. And I just, I wanted to touch on this quickly because I would say if you're a new filmmaker starting out, like the best producer for you is someone like you, or your peers basically. Um, and I would do exactly what Emmanuel is doing and I would forget about big production companies and big producers and I would find somebody who's on the same level as you, who can give you loads of time, loads of enthusiasm um, and you can build your career together. I found it like really frustrating when I was starting out as a producer that all of the kind of writers and directors I was working with would get obsessed about like trying to reach out to big production companies. Um, and I see that now that I have lots of people getting in touch with me now that I've been successful and I, and I think uh, a big a big producer is going to have less time for you is going to have less energy to dedicate on your project um, isn't necessarily more likely to be able to find money for you um, so I would say find somebody who's a really good collaborator somebody who you trust someone who has mutual respect for you and someone who you can build and grow with together because that those partnerships are the partnerships that last forever um, so that would be my advice on that. And if you do feel like you really want to get in touch with a big producer or production company, I would do it at a point where you've got a great track record, you've got an award-winning show, you've got like some heat around the next project you're doing because as producers, we get absolutely inundated. So you have to think of how you can differentiate yourself from the kind of the white noise of lots of people who are making stuff. Um, and come and talk to me at film festivals as well. That's the best way to meet producers. Come and talk to me or other producers at, at, when we're allowed back and the real world which hopefully is soon um and then yeah. my my final question to everyone is what is the best piece of advice you could give to somebody applying to your fund or using your platform and then what is the best advice if the project doesn't happen or they get they get one well, not the project doesn't happen the, 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 they get a no from you or the project isn't successful on kickstarter for example um well the first piece of advice is write the script yeah write the script finish the script that script that's sitting there that's three quarters of the way through or you haven't quite worked out how to close it you know write it get it to a point where someone can see your whole story um so i just got yeah that's my encouragement to all of you to go out and do some more writing tomorrow if you enter our contest and you don't take part um then Again, the, the other side, the mirror side of that is that you did share it, you did get the script to the point where you were, and you got the guts and the stamina to stand there and say, look at me, look at this, this is what I'm doing. Um, when people, when we've announced our placings and the first placings, we get a lot of people come back to us um, and say, well, why not? Why not my project? And I'm always willing, I'm, I'm generally the person receiving those emails and I'm always willing to share our readers internal notes and say here's why you know that's why that's either that whole score wasn't what you wanted or elements of it may have been a surprise um people can get professional coverage from us if they want but you know we take a very hands-on view to our to our fund and to our other contests um so if you don't place always feel welcome to get in touch either through email or through social media um, and we'll do our best to try and help you move move on to whatever the next step is for you. Yeah. Um, I think in terms of 
advice for someone wanting to apply for the funding? I think we've sort of covered the, the, the bones of it here. So I think if my only advice would be if anything's unclear, do just try and get in touch with people. We're, we're a friendly bunch and, you know, we're, yeah. Um, and if you're unsuccessful, um, similarly to Justine, we do offer feedback and we're very happy to follow up with, with a chat within reason, you know, um, we're not able to become your sort of de facto producers, but we will, we will try and kind of steer you in the right direction. But I think in general, the best piece of advice I've ever been given was when I was emerging and it was from a much more established producer to, to me and it was just run at the problem because I think things are so overwhelming and they can be so overwhelming. There is that feeling to just get paralyzed and the kind of the thing is not gonna move, that obstacle's still gonna be there. So just try and muster as much strength as you can to run at it and push it over and just keep doing that as long as your kind of, your sense of well-being will let you really. Um, just quickly, um, Gwen Vi, like you say about getting in touch, how do people get in touch with you or the network execs? Just so people yeah, know. I will, um, I will put a link in the chat box in a second. Um, I'll, I'll do my parting words. Um, mine uh, would, would basically just be to be sort of uh, like on Kickstarter, especially kind of like be realistic about what, you know, what you can achieve in terms of like your, you know, your funding target. Um, because um, the big thing I'll say is you can essentially take like two, two approaches. You can either choose to fit your budget to your film or fit your film to your budget. So, you know, there are just lots of different ways that you can go about making things on kind of whatever budget you have. Um, if it's a sort of narrative short and you have control over the scripts you're writing um, and like budget is an issue, then like restrict yourself to a single location and, um, you know, give yourself that sort of like creative limitation to work with. If you're making like a short documentary, you might be able to like shoot in, and then like kind of fundraise incrementally while you're in post. So making the, the burden of like fundraising a little smaller or like spreading it out over time. Um, but, but yeah, I think that you know, in both instances, like if you're early in your career, you can probably like pull in favors um, with people in your exciting network, like offering to do, to like help out on their films in return, you know, when the time comes. So just like at any budget, um, you can make it work. So kind of be realistic about kind of what you can achieve and how much funding um, that you can achieve uh, when you launch. And if you don't uh, reach your fundraising goal on Kickstarter, then just like, again, think about audience development, keeping in touch with that community, um you know sharing details with them sharing the next steps like just like people love to, to feel a connection through the details and the backstory and the sort of authenticity of somebody with a kind of mission and an idea and kind of getting behind it so just like use that well and and keep in touch with them i just i just wanted to add on to what, what lauren said about working with people uh close to you about uh one of the, one of the producers on the, the film that I just finished uh, doing which is the first one I've worked with the budget. Um, he knows very little about filmmaking uh, and his influence. He didn't work, come, come to any of the sh shoots or anything, but he was absolutely crucial to the pre-production stage in that he's just he's just a really close friend of mine who I've known since for years and years. Um, but we, we, uh, we bounce ideas off each other and I'm, I'm able to talk to him. And he's the type of person who can just talk for hours about anything. Um, and I think so. It's something important to work with people who who you enjoy work, talk, talking to, just in general about about the film, about it, about um, creative stuff. Um, but yeah, I think it's just work with people who will keep that fire burning within you to get this project made, get get your story told. Thank you. And my my kind of quick thoughts on this, and my advice would be apply. Don't rule yourself out, just apply because um, you'd be surprised. And even if you don't get selected, it's a really valuable experience. So if you're not quite sure, just fill out the application because it's really amazing, valuable learning. Um, and just be prolific. You don't need money. There's never been a better time to be a short filmmaker. It's been a digital revolution. You can literally go out there, shoot something on your phone, upload it to an audience immediately. So don't feel like you have to wait for these guys go out there, be prolific, have a good time. Like making films is fun. Remember that it's an enjoyable process um, and just be authentic and um, show us something that only you know about. And that's the, that's the key, I think. And thank you everyone. I've had like a really fun time um, and I found this really useful and insightful. I hope you have too. Um, and if you wouldn't mind me just saying thank you to our panelists in the chat. Thank you very much, everybody.
Uh, thank you. Thank you, Lauren. Thank you so much, Lauren. Thank you to all the panelists. There was so much great advice there. I hope you're seeing the lovely comments that um, you um, got in the chat as well. Um, thank you everyone also for attending and for your lovely questions. I'm so sorry that we were not able to get through um, all of them, but Lauren, well done, because you got through so many of them. I'm, re I'm really impressed. And, and so you. many good ones, sorry, <laughs> yeah. Really, yeah, so many good ones. Um, so just before you go, guys, I wanted to ask you if you wouldn't mind filling in a short survey um, to let us know what you thought of today's lab um, and uh, officially, more officially than the chat box, um, and also how we can improve our online events going forward. So Fiona has just put that link to the survey in the chat box, um, and you will also be emailed it by um, Eventbrite. Um, and as I announced last time, we are hoping to be uh, able to make these labs events hybrid moving forward, so from August. So once a month on a Monday evening now, we'll continue with this series of online sessions that are free to attend, available to everyone worldwide. And then on the following Saturday, we'll host an in-venue event at the BFI South Bank, so in London. And these in-venue sessions will focus on more practical skills and, and learnings from like um, building on the learnings from the Monday Zoom sessions. For those of you who are um, able to make it, um, they will also be useful because you'll finally be able to meet each other face to face and potentially find collaborators for your project that we just learned today is really important. Um, so our next online Monday lab will take place on Monday, the 9th of August. And we'll be discussing producers, just as you asked today. So the creativity required to be a fantastic producer for film and television. Um, and um, so as we said today, the role of the producer is misunderstood a lot of the time. So we're going to do a whole session on it. And we will hold our in-venue August lab on Saturday, the 14th of August. And this session will focus on receiving, uh, giving and receiving notes. Um, so we'll be announcing more details about both of these events very soon through our social channels. So be sure to follow Film Academy on um, Instagram, Twitter, Facebook. Um, and also we'll be including information on how you can get tickets to these events as well. Um, so the last thing just to say is that the session today was recorded. Uh, and I know some of you asked, it will be uploaded to the BFI YouTube channel next week. Um, and we will also email all of you who attended today a link to that recording too. So you will be able to um, watch it again. Um, so thank you everyone so much. Um, have a lovely rest of the weekend and see you all in August. Bye.